Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. My name is Katie Gallos. I'm an international moderator and journalist, and I am so excited. I'm so excited to learn about all these ideas that are presented now by global change makers from all over the world. So I cannot wait with you, you know, to learn more about these young voices, the young global change makers and changes who are becoming really a powerful voice on the most pressing global issues. So we are not talking, talking to only about problems and challenges. We want to learn more about their ideas, their visions, their motivations, and of course their approaches to find global, you know, global solutions and of course local solutions for global challenges. Just to give you a glimpse on what's coming up now, and of course to motivate you to stay in the line in the stream with us, we're heading over to Honduras in a moment in Central America. We are traveling to Algeria, India, Australia, Uganda. So there's a lot to come up. Before we dive into all these different ideas, into different areas, into different concepts, let's get the oval idea of the Young Global Changers event. And with me now, and I see him already, is Ole Spies. He's a young program, he's a program lead of Young Global Changers. So Ole, you are young, so we are all young. So this is um, absolutely correct to say that you're the program lead of the Young Global Changers. What's coming up now? And can you tell us a little bit more, who are these ambitious young changes that I'm so excited to learn more about? Yeah, thank you, Kati. Thanks very much. Um, yes, me too. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And um, let me tell you just a few things about the Young Global Changers in general. Um, so we, we started, we here at the Global Solutions Initiative started in 2017. Um, and by now we have about 350 young people from more than 100 different countries. From, from all continents, all regions of the world. And all of them are, as you just mentioned, change makers in their, in their own way. Um, and they're involved in, in research, in social entrepreneurship, uh, small business ventures, but also nonprofit activities, um, advocacy work. So you, that's a lot of different things. Um, and each year we're inviting them to come to the summit. Usually they come to Berlin and participate in the Global Solutions Summit here. Um, this year, we, we have to do it virtually, um, and um, I'm so excited that, that uh, so many of them are, are here with us uh, today. Can you tell us a little bit more about the projects and what's you know, the connecting point among them? So maybe uh, I'll tell you about the Young Global Changes that we and the project that we will talk about today. Um, we've selected four projects from four different continents. Um, and we'll talk uh, to a young medical doctor from Algeria who's aiming to inspire young kids in Algeria, also a lot of girls from Algeria, to become involved in, in engineering, in jobs and technology, or, or in medicine. Um, we have a project that is working with people in India, people who are involved in the dismantling of electronic waste, and they are helping them to to get to safe uh, working conditions and into a better uh, surrounding and empower, empower them. We have a project from Honduras, um, a country that had its fair share of, um, let's say, political troubles and, and even corruption. So people are you know, somewhat, somewhat disengaged maybe in Honduras. And this project is aiming to engage people, get them to be active citizens. And we'll have a project from Australia um, that, that sells coffee, which, which I love. Um, and um, they, they don't only sell fair coffee, they're also a project that is fully circular. And uh, I think that is super, super fascinating. And I look forward to, to hearing about these projects. So we're gonna start with the project for Coffee Junkies right away, all the things for presenting. Just one last question to you, you know, come looking closer on the title, Global Challenges and Local Solutions. Why did you decide for that title? Okay. I think we're all aware that the, the challenges that we are facing right now are, are of global scale um, and, and urgency. And um, we also, here at Global Solutions, we believe that solutions need to be catered to the problem at hand. And, much of it starts on a regional or even a local level. And so, so we wanted to look at what change on the ground can actually look like and that, that you can start locally and, and bring change about in your community um, and that way uh, help tackling these global bigger problems that we, we talk about here at the summit. 
Thank you, Ola. Thanks for your insights and, of course, for your outlook into our interesting day. And you just mentioned it, of course. We're going to start with the topic for coffee junkies. Let's hear more about the change makers concentrating and focusing on the coffee value chain coming from Australia. But the journey of their coffee journey started somewhere else because it all started with the business in Uganda. And therefore, we're going to start with a little movie. It started in 2017 when Brody and Darcy met Dan on a produce farm in northern Uganda. Dan told them about where he grew up, near the misty slopes of Mount Elgon, where some of the best coffee in the world was growing. The boys took the coffee back to Sydney to see if the local coffee snobs agreed. They did. So, they jumped back on their AeroPress powered bikes and set out to learn everything they could about coffee, development and business. They learned a few things. One, the coffee industry is extremely wasteful. Single-use cups, bags, and 75,000 tons of coffee grounds are thrown away each year. Two, gender inequality and land management are major issues in Uganda. But international development is a complex space where even experts make mistakes. Three, lasting impact needs sustainable financing a model beyond fundraising and traditional corporate social responsibility initiatives. So, they created Kua, and here's what they're doing about it. They launched a zero-waste coffee lending service for Australian companies. Coffee is lent to a company. Their employees enjoy it, then it's collected for reuse in other cool products, because we think the world should move to a circular economy. All profits are reinvested to scale community projects that have been proven to make a positive impact in Uganda. They've since been joined by Bree, Monica and a whole team of legends who are working behind the scenes to make this thing happen. It's such a no-brainer. It's non-profit. It's zero waste. That's why the coffee tastes better. So Kua is not just tackling one challenge within the coffee business but several uh, you know several challenges on the consumer side also and so let's break it down and i'm very delighted to have the coolest director of impact with us brianna kerr and one member of the legend so to say from the video a member of the leading team at korea hamish Chui. hello to both of you great to see you hello. thank you for joining us hello <laughs> thanks for having us how many liters of coffee do you drink every day that you decide that we want to change the whole coffee business? You must be coffee junkies, right? Uh, we do our best not to get too carried away. But uh, yeah, a few coffees a day never hurt. Brianna, how many liters? Or is it just free, free coffee for the whole team every time? <laughs> a lot of free coffee. Um, at the workplace, we actually work at um, our coffees on the machines here so we definitely drink a lot and we make a lot of coffees every day too. <laughs> Tell me a little bit where it all started to get involved. We just saw the video you traveled to Uganda but it's a it's a big step to then decide oh I want to change the coffee value chain development you know so where does it come from from just traveling to a foreign country to actually deciding I want to change your whole business? I think uh, for us the Coffee in Uganda was an opportunity and, and a vehicle to do some good, to make some impact, um, especially in Australia, where a very high percentage, you know, 99% of what we drink here uh, has a huge value chain at the other side in other countries where we don't necessarily get to see um, and we don't get to uh, make as much impact as we'd like to. Coffee uh, as a vehicle means that we can educate here and use it to do good. Brianna, what, you know, impact is such a buzzword and everybody's talking about human impact and impact. Can you break it down? What change do you actually bring to a female coffee farmer, for example, in Uganda? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Kua does impact in four key ways. The first, I think that video touched on it, is that we direct source from smallholder farmers. So over 50% of our farmers, to your question about female farmers, are um, female. <laughs> um, and, and, yeah, so we support smallholder farming families that are generally uh, female-led. Um, so that's the first part is direct sourcing, and that allows us to keep as much value in the country of origin as possible. 
in the coffee industry, it's crazy. Only 10% on average of the value of a cup of coffee actually stays in the country of origin. So part of Kua's mission is to ensure that as much value is actually kept in the country at the beginning. So for us, that looks like around 40% um, being kept in the country versus 10%. The second thing that we do a little bit differently and another way that we do impact is the closed loop system. So it's all good and well to think about the supply chain and all the stuff that happens overseas, but actually a lot of harm that happens in the coffee industry is here in Australia in relation to not only modern slavery and exploitation in supply chains, but also in terms of sustainability. So we deliver everything in reusable packaging and we collect all of the spent coffee grounds and distribute them to a network of community gardens and make other cool products like body scrubs and things out of them as well. Um, and then the last so interesting. part. Ooh. Oh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 go on. Sorry, I didn't no. want to interrupt you. <laughs> that was the questions in my head. What's the last part, Brian? Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and we're also not profit. So as well as kind of ensuring that value is kept in the country at the beginning of the supply chain, where almost taking affirmative action, I suppose, in returning value to the country of origin once profit is made here in Australia. And that's how we can keep 40% um, of the value of a cup of coffee in Uganda. And we're always working at how we can, yeah, improve that number. I think it's so interesting because you just not have only one question in your mind, where does the, co- the, the coffee uh, come from? You only, you also, um, you know, focus on the question, where does the coffee end up? So this is really interesting. The one thing is really to focus on the Ugandan part, but how did you come up to actually change also the system in your home country in Australia? Where does this come from? You know, I know and I've read you lived in a house together to really work on the project on Kuya. Is this something that was rooted in there to say, hey, we also have to change something here? Or where did you get that idea from? Yeah, I think it comes from realizing that all of these problems happen in systems, right? So a social problem doesn't happen in isolation from an environmental problem and they're all complexly interconnected. So um, for us, we knew that we couldn't really solve one without addressing the other. Um, And yeah, even when you think about the Global Solutions Initiative or the Global Solutions Summit and this idea of recoupling different facets of society and actually looking at how they interrelate and overlap. That's definitely translatable, I guess, to how we saw our problem with coffee. Um, I think the other thing is it's very easy to think that problems lie, um, you know, in other people's backyards and to say, oh, all the problems in the coffee industry are actually overseas. But when you think about the relationship that a consuming country has with a producing country, there's two players in that game, right? So, um, yeah, it's not just about addressing all of the sustainable sourcing stuff, which is super important in Uganda, but also addressing, um, like Hamish mentioned, education and ensuring that people are connected to the stories of their products here in Australia as well. Hamish, can you go into and break it down for me again? Which change do you see when you, because you've also traveled with Kuya to Uganda and now you see how the coffee waste is kind of recycled. So where do you see the biggest changes? Just explain it to me, because for me, the concept, of course, is not new, but sometimes, and you know, you need just the vision and the example to understand it. Yeah, sure. So um, I suppose in country, uh, and luckily enough, I was able to go and visit the, uh, the same growing region and in fact buying station from where we sourced our coffee for this year Um, on their end uh, by by paying a higher price for the coffee and getting to know um, each of the farming families and the community producing the coffee that means that we can actually see uh, those communities grow Um, they can build infrastructure uh, to sort of uh, have more of an opportunity in their communities by growing better quality coffee and seeing their profits invested back into that community. On this side, when we see the waste being taken from our big corporate offices, which is our primary customer, and being reinvested back into community gardens and into products that are useful within our community, we can see the the loop get closed in both sides. um, And that's been you know, quite powerful and something that we try and pass on to the people buying our coffee to let them know that uh, there's sort of two sides to everything we do. Yeah. 
And what are your clients and customers are saying, you know, all the offices that get your coffee, are they involved in the idea? Do they want to see a future plan from you to even grow more? Or are they just surprised by even the possibility of being carbon positive as you claim to be in your website? So what, what are the reactions? Um, I think Bray could speak more to the um, carbon positivity as she got to work a lot on that uh, in recent months. But I think for me, um, as I'm the one going in and out of offices every day, uh, people uh, really don't have much of an idea about coffee at all. And we're in a really amazing position that we can educate them not only on coffee, um, but we can get them engaged in, you know, what does it actually look like for uh, a farming community to have this coffee processed? What does it look like to get it over to you? And do you actually realize how much waste is being created just from you drinking your morning cup of coffee? Ray, maybe you can dive in here as well, because of course your motto is also living happy days. And I know in Sydney, there are a lot of coffee chunkers and the third wave coffee cafes. So what is it to actually communicate this carbon positivity? How does it actually function? Yeah, so we went through a process last year where we measured our product footprint. So we looked at our entire business. And like I mentioned um, a little a few, few minutes ago, we're really passionate about ensuring that um, every time there's an opportunity to do business as usual, we choose an option that's better than business as usual. So a big part of that is looking at our carbon footprint and the impact of our business. Um, so we went through the process last year of measuring that footprint um, and offsetting it at 200%. Obviously, offsetting is not the perfect solution and we want to make that clear. Um, and we've done everything to reduce, you know, emissions in our operations. Um, but what we, why we, I suppose, made that decision to offset at 200% was to send a market signal that businesses need to be doing more. We're facing really big, hairy challenges um, like climate change. And we think as a business um, ourselves, it's part of our responsibility and also to talk to the businesses that we work with around um, their role in, in minimising their footprint too. Amazing. Thank you so much for your insights. Bree and Hamish, thanks for joining us in the stream. Thank you. And well, I hope to connect with you later on in the network session. So thanks again for the moment. Wow, already very much impressed by our first uh, yeah, project, by our start into the coffee business. Thank you, guys. I cannot wait to go on. Of course, I hope you are ready as well. We're going to travel now a little bit coming from Uganda and Australia, jumping over the North Atlantic Ocean to Central America and focusing on global changes in Honduras. Then uh, this is giving us a really difficult and different life environment, an environment um, which is difficult due to violence, corruption, less and less trust in government and public institutions. So it's quite a challenge to foster actually citizen engagement and empowerment of the locals, empowerment of the Hondurians. It's a big, it's a big question. So we break it down. We try to break it down in 10 minutes. How does it work to actually foster uh, civil engagement? We will learn now more about that with the change makers by Noob Lab from Honduras. It's a citizen innovation lab and academy that brings together the tools and the skills to really engage the citizens. I say hello and buenos dias to Ana Rocio Santos Mendoza. She is the founder of Noob Lab. And of course, um, buenos dias to Angelica Monzada. She's the university professor and also a social entrepreneur uh, from Honduras. She's the founder of her own NGO supporting children struggling with cancer you know, used to be a student uh, at or part of the workshop by the new club and now a trainer by herself. So I see a complete uh, female expert power here. Thanks for joining us to YouTube. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, Katy. Thank you very much for having both of us here to present what we do with Noob Lab in Honduras. Um, I think the first question is already very interesting and important question to understand a bit more about civic engagement in Honduras. How does it work? Um, yeah, maybe, is, Anna, Anna, sorry to interrupt you. Maybe you can give us, because yes. I just mentioned some struggles, but of course you are the expert. Tell us a little bit about the surrounding that the NGO, the Noob Lab is actually working in. Yes, so um, Noob Lab, as you said, is like a citizen innovation lab. So we are working with not only NGOs, but also initiatives with um, 
activists, social movements, like whoever in Honduras that really wants to trigger a change, whether in their communities, in their workplace, uh, university, so, you know, different spaces. Um, so uh, nowadays, this is a very interesting year for Nukla because this is an election year. And so it's, uh, it's very interesting in terms of, you know, when we talk about civic engagement, how in this, um, settings and environment can we foster a civic engagement so it has been a very interesting journey for Nukla. Um, we started uh, kind of just sharing a bit more about the social innovations you know how can people uh, identify problems in their communities and collaboratively um, work on solutions and implement them and you know iterate the process, what's not working, what's working, how can we replicate this in other regions in the country. So we started with that and it has been evolving Noob Lab and at this point we uh, are creating spaces to support organizations or just you know citizens, small groups that really want to trigger this change in different topics. So um, in uh, topics of corruption, how we can make uh, public institutions more accountable to us Hondurans about what they're doing. Also on topics of poverty alleviation. Um, last year was uh, particularly interesting because of the challenges posed by COVID-19, but also two hurricanes hit the country, like one after the other. And this was, um, this actually trigger a lot, a lot of engagement from citizens. And um, this is actually something interesting that I wanted to mention that um, in, you know, in the midst of um, the problems that Honduras might, might be facing, you know, corruption, um, poverty, violence. What really we want to like um, showcase is like how citizens are really responding. I think younger generations are really taking the lead. So, you know, not waiting for only the government or international organizations or um, foreign NGOs help us, but how we can Honduras like trigger and, you know, start this change um, on our own. But of course, in order to do that, we need to prepare these younger generations to be able to do so. Absolutely. Thank you for these insights. Angelica, maybe you can come in here because, you know, we've heard now, of course, it's election year, plus it's still these unprecedented, un, you know, crazy times with the pandemic in the world. So can you tell me a little bit more about how do you want to gain trust? Trust is such a big emotional word. How is it even possible if the world has a thousand different problems? And of course, there are so many individual problems in these difficult times. So how do you actually work on the tools that make people believe in trust back again? When we work with Honduran young people, we actually try them and us to be involved in the process, not just letting the government uh, do their work, but also trying us to be involved every single day, taking decisions, going out and doing our, uh, our vote, for example, is something that will help us to gain that trust again and to have a little bit more of uh, a unity of our community also to have um, like a, a little bit more of a vote within the institutions. And can you tell me a little bit about the tools and the instruments? Because I think to all these big questions, it's like a million dollar questions that you're trying to answer and that you're trying to engage. Anna, which tools are really bringing the change that you're talking about right now? So that's, um, I think in this last three years, we have spotted actually from, you know, uh, collaborating and supporting the organizations, what are these tools and methods and skills that they feel they need to work on or strengthen to be able to um, start or continue this change. So um, we have spotted that, you know, like tools for the process of, you know, identifying a problem. What are the, the methods that we can use? How we can um, identify these problems, not only as in individuals, but as a community, you know, collaboratively. Um, and then it passes from, you know, how we can brainstorm on possible um, solutions, 
how do we consider the voices of the communities in that process of thinking, you know, not from like a top-down approach, you know, what we think might work for the people, but actually asking the people, you know, like what will work for them. And then, um, and in order to do all of that, you know, like there are methods and there are tools that can um, support communities or groups or activists to be able to do this. And then um, also, you know, like things like even brainstorming, you know, like, like what are the methods and tools that we can use to brainstorm about possible ideas, how we can do it, how we can structure our thoughts, our um, ideas, how then we can use that to move to next steps. And then, um, so it's, it's kind of like different tools for this process from identifying a problem, uh, hearing a bit more about the community, what the community has to say, uh, what will work for the community, empathizing a bit with, you know, the needs that they have. Also considering um, the resources that the communities have, you know, like, because maybe a solution can be sound very good, but then, you know, they don't have the resources to actually make it happen. Maybe they have some other kind of resources that will make it more feasible to think about a solution. And then, um, you know, and things like prototyping, if, you know, like the solution is um, a hard word, like a product, something physical, how they can prototype this, you know, like, so these different elements, what we try to do is um, create spaces, whether it's through workshops, um, challenges, you know, like sessions, uh, just like um, talks, when we want to create these spaces to be able to share them with them. And like one recent um, project that we're, we want to start this year is for example, to um, create more you know, spaces that are more specific to share these methods. So to like, um, and also explore a bit more what the uh, people need. Mm -hmm. like what Thanks, yeah, gracias. Uh, Elika, I just want to come in with you again, because of course we are living in times where everybody is sitting at home doing home office or homeschooling. And we just heard from Anna that, of course, it's a, it's a big uh, task, of course, to bring together a community. But how do you do it on the ground in these times, bring together ideas, you know, gathering a community, gathering different groups of people, and of course, deciding what works and maybe what doesn't work. So how does it actually work? Take us with you into the workspace, wherever that might be, in a digital space or maybe in a real space. So definitely the pandemia has changed us, especially in Honduras. We weren't that ready for home office or trying to bring everything throughout the technology. But definitely having these spaces, we do Zoom meetings, we do calls, we do also mentoring within dif different specific uh, teams of entrepreneurs that are doing groundwork in different places in Honduras. So actually technology has brought us more connections within us, having Anna uh, talking to entrepreneurs and trying to do all this creative uh, talks and mentoring has been really, really good for all of us. And as a last quick question, what comes up next? What is the plan in this crazy election year? What is your priority to focus on right now? I think our priority is to raise awareness. Uh, we're planning to do that through different uh, events this year before elections. And when I mean awareness is to um, raise awareness that uh, democracy is not happening uh, one time every four years in Honduras, that uh, we need to think about democracy in a sustainable way. You know, like after I go to the to vote, like, you know, it's not where it ends. It's actually where it all starts. You know, like you are voting for someone and then you need to create mechanisms to keep those people accountable to the people, creating like spaces where um, citizens can be heard. And um, yeah, so like the, the first um, idea is like to create this awareness before election. Um, and then after that, we'll be actually creating these spaces, you know, these mechanisms, how we can connect citizens with, for example, the major in a city and how, you know, there can be like a, a feedback uh, mechanism between both. So, you know, that it is not just on the booth, uh, voting booth that they hear what citizens have to say, but also after that and keep taking it into account, you know, in different parts of the policy um, process. 
Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Muchas, muchas gracias. And greetings mm -hmm. to you wherever you are right now in Honduras. I wish you a lot of success and I can't wait to hear more from you with more questions when we get together again in a networking session. So thanks for the moment. For Anna and Angelica, thanks for joining us in the stream. We are zooming now into India, precisely to Bangalore to meet our changes. With me now is Leah Verli, she's the founder of EcoWork based in Switzerland, and Natasha Sharma, design researcher based in Bangalore. Natasha, I'd like to start with you, of course, because the medias are spread, you know, and covered with numbers and figures from your situation right now. Maybe you can give us a glimpse right now. How do you feel and what's for you the current situation? Um, it's honestly Rodim. Uh, and they say that it's still just one fourth the numbers that are actually getting affected by the pandemic. And the health system right now is collapsing and working a lot only on just civilians coming together and raising funds for oxygen and for the injections and the medicines. So right now we're seeing people power, but not so much the government power. And yeah, that's kept us all of us very tensed. Yeah. Thank you so much for this live impression. Dia, when I talked and when I gave the, the first figures on it's a big figure of e-waste, can you dive into that topic? Because for a lot of people, e-waste is just a word, you know, with no pictures combined. We have a video. Maybe you can explain um, while showing the video, what is actually, is it about the big problem of electronic waste? And we start the video. So here in this picture, and you can see how the e-waste e cables are dismantled. It's done manually. And as you can see, they do it on the floor. They, they are very efficient, actually. As you can see, they are experienced. Um, but it's the informal sector. They do it. They have no, in that sense, right to, to do any complaints or anything to receive support. Um, so with EcoWork, we aim to set up a co-working space, a building that provides a proper environment where they get tools as well um, to dismantle electronic waste. We are going into that co-working space and into your future plans in a moment, but please be a little bit uh, with more details for me. Where is this, all this e-waste coming from? You know, is it, is it a national e-waste coming only from India or is it also with international aspects that we see here? So a lot of e-waste comes from India itself. I mean, India is a, is a huge country. It's had, it has a lot of population and um, more and more people want to have a cell phone, want to have laptops. So there's an increase of electronic devices and new devices as well. That also results in, in waste. Everything that we use, be it in, in Europe, be it in America or India, everything at some point it becomes waste and it's been thrown away and we need to think of what happens then and there need to be processes in place um, structures and yeah facilities in place how to handle this waste in a proper and safe manner uh, Natasha what is your perspective of course um, you know based in India what are the biggest challenges that you see in that e-waste topic when we look closer on the environment of the e-waste dismantler? So, because we've been working on ground in Delhi and Delhi being the hub of e-waste, what we've realized is that this informal is a huge and actually a very beautiful network that they have you know, done for their livelihoods. So when you see it in that perspective, as a livelihood, it's a great option, but the impacts that it has on the way they work and their health, and then of course the environment, in, environmental impact is, um, is something that the dismantlers haven't seen. They haven't really looked at it from that perspective. So for them, it's just livelihoods and not so much the impact. So to then go there and connect the two has been a challenge. To, to show what the best practices are while they have to, they are the ones who've created this network for decades has been a very challenging uh, process for us as well. So, yeah. 
What was the biggest challenge? Because you were mentioning that there is already an, a big network, you know, grown uh, for ages and of course a big community. So how do you do it and how do you change a little bit, little steps in a sustainable way? Dia, you know, where do you come in from as a, a methodological a aspect as well? So where do you keep the balance and of course improving something, bringing change, but nevertheless also keeping the strength of the community on the ground? I would say one of the biggest challenges to, to gain their trust and make them understand how they can do things in a safer and healthier way and also why. For them, it needs to make sense and often economically, but then they also, you always need to think of it's a whole community, it's a whole system and network. So they depend on a lot of other people and stakeholders. So we need to integrate them and we need to build up this trust. Um, and this is, is very essential. So one of our, our team members, he actually grew up in these communities and he has the connection. And this is very central to gain access, to gain contact and build up this, con this, this yeah, trust, this bond of trust to make them understand that we are there and we are trying to enable them in their business development. And we are not taking away their business or we are not just pushing them to do things differently, but we want to work together with them and we want to help them support them enabling enabling them how to make the process better and safer yeah you mentioned that you create a co-working space when i think of co-working spaces you know i have shiny desks in my mind i have all these um, yeah new work stylish ideas that are kind of gathered in a big 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 office but is this something that you need to integrate into the e-waste sector or do i have just the wrong imagination of a so-called co-working space what do you plan how do you bring all these worlds together natasha that's actually a very interesting question because i feel like when we as researchers and designers go with the solution we already have an idea about it but the minute we go all our assumptions kind of break so there was a session, I think it was our third visit where we showed them some tables and some tools and they found it so alien to the way they work right now. They said, we, we love our floor. Uh, the idea of even a table was something so new. They said, you need to actually make something that we can sit on the floor and do. It wasn't like they were not resistant to the idea. It's just that it was so new. So what we realized is that we have to kind of show it to them in stages. We cannot show them this new future or this idea of best practices as a bang and be like, okay, this is what it'll look like, but it needs to be like, you know, when we were showing them tables, they said, you know, but where is our prayer space? So the things that matter to them do come out through these visuals that we want to show them. But at the same time, like, it's just important that we do not bring such a change that it just changes their way of working. And that also is a thing where you cannot, they won't be able to trust us to continue the work. Yeah. Yeah, let's have a look on the photos. Of course, we've seen uh, your 3D um, photos. Can you explain a little bit more what actually is planned on the ground? We just got a glimpse from, from Natasha talking about desks. I do see some desks, but how do you integrate everything that in the end, you know, everything is happy, you know, well done. And of course that everybody is happy with that change. So this is very challenging and this is an ongoing process to be honest with you. So here you can see a, a visual that how, that's how we ima imagine the space to be like. And you can see small walls that divide the spaces. For us, it's important that the the informal micro entrepreneurs, they have their own space and they know it's still their business. We want to provide a safe environment and a safe building. We want to show them how they can set up the, the process. So in one box, you have the, the e-waste, the whole components, then you dismantle it on the table using tools. And then you throw the different fractions into different bins. And through that, you can fasten up the process and by this also become more economically by also just paying for the space and the time that you need. So you can also save on money, not just increasing your revenues, but also save on, on your costs. So that's kind of the basic model that we are aiming for. And here we, we aim to provide some, some simple machines that they can increase their efficiency, um, where they can rent again the space or the machine only for a couple of hours. And so they don't need to have a big investment up front but still they can use it and apply the, the process, the machines. 
Natasha, how were the reactions? You know, sometimes everybody is afraid of change. How was the reaction on the ground? Are they excited, curious, or are they also a little bit hesitant? These different families, yeah, depending on really the structures on the ground. They, they basically already have been always working from home. So just the idea of travel to some place and do the dismantling was huge. And then when we started showing them the visuals, they were actually very curious. But the first question they asked was, where is it? Where can we see it? Uh, they were ready to go and have a look at it. Except we had to tell them that these were visualization based on your insights, uh, to which a lot of conversations opened up to which conversations about, you know, the table size needs to be this big or the stool needs to be this high. Can it be adjustable? Uh, uh, we need this much storage space. Uh, so a lot of uh, inquiry started like expanding just through these visuals. So initially we thought they were limiting, but it just grew to conversations where they were like, are our names going to be there? Uh, where we're going to sit? Uh, will we have ID cards? Uh, so a lot of ownership kind of questions started coming. They were like, how do we find our space in this space that you're offering to us? Um, so, yeah, that was interesting to see. Very interesting question to find a space in a new space. Thank you so much for your insights, Dea and Natasha. Greetings to India and Switzerland. Thanks for your insights, learning more from EcoWorks. And of course, I'm also looking forward to hear more from you later in the network session. Thanks for now. Thank you. And we go on with our next project, science, technology, engineering, and math. I would say all these subjects, subjects are perfectly made for young girls to learn, to explore, of course, and to discover. It's not always easy to get access uh, just at the right time, at the right age. But our next change maker changes that. She, is it absolutely worth hearing more about it? Because she founded STEPS. And we travel now to Algeria with this next chapter. Welcome and bienvenue to our next guest. She's a young doctor and founder of STEPS, Wamima Benjama. Bonjour. And we also have her colleague. She's a second year medical student and a former student in STEPS. So she was trained and now she is a mentor herself. She's running workshops for kids in biology, robotics, and astronomy. With her, with Omaima, is Imen Anish. Bonjour also to you, Imen. Nice to see you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, Maima, I just heard, I mean, your doctor, your frontline worker, you just came out of a shift. Now you're joining us in the stream. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. How are you doing? You know, how do you get your strength? Well, a little tired, but I'm making it. I'm really inspired by all the interviews of the social uh, activists and the social uh, enterprise that I've seen. And it brings a lot of life to me, honestly, even with this tiredness. <laughs> thank you. Well, you're glowing. This is amazing. And Iman, thanks, you, of course, for joining us as well. I read a lot about you. You were trained for a robotic competition. You are, you know, very much interested in biology, robotics and astronomy. Is that something that you grew up with or is that something that kind of developed through different projects and ideas and conversations? Where did you get that interest from? Well, uh, growing up, I had a big sense of scientific curiosity. So I was kind of interested in everything that requires the constant research and development. So at first it was astronomy. I was so passionate about astronomy, but it's almost unexistent in our country. <laughs> So I had no hope of pursuing my career in astronomy. And uh, actually STEPS was a chance for me to inspire young kids to pursue careers in astronomy. Uh, I mean, from their young age, so they can actually prepare for it, which is a chance that I didn't have. Umaima, I mean, this is super interesting to hear, you know, really focusing on something that is hidden for a lot of young girls and boys. When was the moment that you realized we have to change something and that we have to make it accessible, especially for the young generation, to create the next generation of leaders within the scientific approach? What was the moment, you know, that gave you or that gave you the motivation? I'm, I'm founding steps now. 
Yeah, I think my experience is similar to Iman. Uh, we've we both been to uh, an educational system that was so focused on memorization, like gave us so little access to technology. So when we grew up and we started to getting exposed from like online resources and like seeing other people and how the other like how the world works, we realized how much we were missing and how much uh, limited uh, access we have been given as students. So that for me was uh, around my third or second year medical as a medical student. I had this opportunity of an exchange program and we were learning about social entrepreneurship. And the first question that came to us is, what is the problem that you want to work on that you feel like if you worked on, you're gonna change, um, you're gonna change, you're gonna make, gonna make a big change in your country. And the first thing that came to me is, I wanna see like a better education for my uh, young self, so for my young, uh, you know, other young Algerians, and imagining how uh, it would be for them uh, to get a great education in science and technology and engineering. Wow, that's such a beautiful goal to change the whole system somehow to make it more accessible. So of course, like I bet there are challenges and problems on the way, and people that don't like your idea. And people that like you, you know, people that are encouraging you and doing what you want to do. So can you give us a glimpse of what has been one of the biggest struggles for you and, of course, for keeping on the track of changing what you want to change? Yeah. So, uh, like, one of the big struggles is that, I mean, accessing a public uh, educational system is very difficult, um, like, with the whole you know, uh, like uh, structures and you have to go through uh, different entities and everything. Uh, and it's sad because what we offer is very interesting. So we have to do it outside like public schools. And I think this is one of uh, the major goals of STEPS is to be able to bring what we uh, give to the whole like public uh, education here in Algeria. And we also have a little video because, of course, we can talk a lot about that in theory, but I would say this is the right moment to just jump in and to have a quick look into what it looks like actually on the ground. Let's have a look. Iman, what comes up as an emotion when you when you watch that video? You know, what does it mean for you to see these young people now focusing and talking together and of course getting inspired together? How did you get inspired? Because you were also part of a workshop before you started as a mentor. So which emotions, um, which emotion does come up when you see these these images? Uh, well, it's really touching because uh, I remember when the kids come at first. They feel like it's rocket science, that they can't make it. And uh, then they realize that they can actually accomplish things. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, girls who are just interested in biology, when they see younger kids who can accomplish uh, hard tasks in uh, coding, robotics, and uh, other Engineer. hard engineering fields uh, they actually just uh, jump into it and uh, discover new passions but what do you think about it? doing a workshop and being involved in a workshop is one thing but does the interest and the motivation stay after the workshops you know do people really get engaged in studying then maybe robotics or do they Do they just leave it in that one or two workshops, Umaima? How do you see the sustainability of, of steps, you know, and the interest along several workshops and along a different and a longer period of time? Yeah, because we have started only like uh, two years ago. So we still have like uh, one of our young students are still not going to college yet. But one of our older students, which is uh, uh, a, a best friend of Iman, actually, she has uh, changed her, um, you know, her path, like coming to steps. She was hesitant in choosing engineering, but now she's an electronic engineering student doing amazing uh, work in her own university, participating in clubs. And it's very satisfying to see her going through that path, uh, especially given the fact that it's 
generally considered uh, a male dominated career like uh, with with computer science and with um, other fields of engineering. Yeah, absolutely. This is something, Iman, I'd like to ask you. I mean, you know, you're working in robotics, you're interested in astronomy and, and, and robotics and biology, definitely male dominated fields. So how do you tackle critical voices coming from male colleagues and friends? Is there anything coming up? You know, do you have to fight for being, being actually engaged in the fields or is it rather calm? Well, uh, I'm not scared to explain that uh, engineering is just not just about repairing cars as uh, all Algerians think. Um, uh, I'm not scared of stereotypes. Actually, there's a, a fast growing community of young girls who fight these uh, stereotypes. And uh, my advice would be to um, keep exploring different options and uh, actually thinking how you can apply what you have learned. And for girls who are afraid of uh, stereotypes, I'm here to tell them that there are many Algerian women who did great in STEM and proved otherwise. And uh, I invite them to check out on YouTube Algerian women success stories. I'm sure they'll get so inspired. Wow, Iman, what a pep talk for every young, engaged woman to really tackle all the stereotypes. So thank you so much, Umaima. Last question to you, of course, you know, creating a, a space for getting into science, but I hear also, it's also creating a space for connecting women. So how do you combine these two missions somehow in steps? And of course, what is the plan in future? I think it's it comes naturally uh, because a lot of women are interested and motivated to join us in steps. So what we have is we have this dynamic of mentors who are like women who are um, either students in science and tech and engineering or already a graduate. And then we have younger, uh, younger, you know, students who are being mentored by these uh you know, by this, by these amazing women. So what we have is this role model. And I think the most important thing uh, for, for young girls is just to see uh, someone older than them making it in that field. It gives them such a relief and such um, like a, a clear vision. And I think uh, it just comes naturally in steps. We don't have to, you know, um, make a lot of effort. Uh, it just, it, they come to us. Thank you, Messi, Iman, and of course you are mentored by yourself. So may I ask you, you know, what makes you happy in that mentor role? You used to be a student. We are all students. You know, lifelong learning is absolutely an important topic. But Iman, can you tell me what makes you happy in being a mentor yourself? Uh, well, as I said before, uh, it makes me very happy to give uh, younger girls some chase chances that I didn't have at that time. Um, what can I say? Uh, Something that you were impressed by because, you know, you are a role model, of course, for younger girls. Um, maybe there's um, a situation that you can share with us where somebody came up to you and told you a story of motivation and inspiration through you because you were there. Is there something that comes to your mind that, or that you experienced as a mentor? Well, not really. Um, what can I say? Umaima, maybe you have a story. I mean, you are in the field for a very long time and you know Iman for, you know, since the beginning. So do you have a similar story? Yeah, so what we have is like, in, in general, uh, girls when they come to steps, they are very shy, and they sit in the back of the of the like if, if it's a workshop, they sit in the back and they're hesitant to share or hesitant to talk. And I can see them in the workshop, like working with Iman or with Aya, and they uh, teach them a little bit of tricks of how to present their project or how to work on their little project. And you can like see them go out of their shell, and they are like expressing their ideas, like they're talking freely. And this this small things and. You can see how like this small shy girl have like started to glow just after one uh, workshop. 
And we actually saw that Iman wasn't shy at all. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for sharing this story with us. And thanks, of course, to both of you. Merci for joining us, Iman and Wamaima, and greetings, warm greetings to Algeria. Thank, thank you. you so thank much. you. Thanks to you. I do have, of course, a billion more questions to all our project members, to all our visionaries, to all our global changes. I had to break it down to 10 minutes for each project. But the good news is we have more time now in the networking session. It's also a spot for you to gather and, of course, to ask your more than 100 more questions. Meet us now in a very quick, short Zoom discussion round. It's a campfire uh, with some of the participants of the session. I'll see you there in a minute.